on behalf of Rutgers University and the Department of Africana Studies, I want to welcome all of you in the beginning of our year-long festivities marking our 40th anniversary. None of tonight's program would have been possible without the diligent efforts of President McCormick, Karen Stubis, Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs, Kim Manning, Vice President for University Relations, Douglas Greenberg, Executive Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, Delia Pitts, Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs, and Peter Klein, former Executive Vice Dean of SAS. We have also been supported by Nicole Pride, our PR Specialist in the Office of Media Relations, Donna Austin, and Sharnae Robinson, who leads the student chapter of the NAACP. And those are the ushers that you see who have volunteered their time. We owe all of them a tremendous debt of gratitude for transforming our initial ideas into reality. <laughs> Marking this year's celebration is the theme, Africana on the World Stage, reflecting the global dimensions of the diaspora and the discipline. Tonight, we also pay tribute to the 100th anniversary of the NAACP and the major role that they have played in the enduring struggle for social justice. In profound ways, their challenge to America to honor its democratic ideals changed the quality of our lives and created an environment for social change. In 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination became the political catalyst for the founding of black studies programs and departments across the country. A year later, students, activists, and faculty members at Rutgers, with a view towards democratizing the university, demanded a more diverse faculty and student body as well as the creation of the discipline of Africana Studies. Africana Studies at Rutgers was on the cutting edge of the discipline by building a foundation based on the intellectual inquiry of Africa and the African diaspora. In doing so, it became one of the forerunners of what is now viewed as an interdisciplinary mode of inquiry. We were also one of the first to be recognized as a department, a trend that we see now in place. The primary goals of Africana Studies is to interrogate in a critical and comparative fashion the various theoretical paradigms and schools of interpretations of the African, Caribbean, and African American experience. And number two, to explore the connections between peoples of African descent and other diasporic communities. In Africana studies, we hold the position that intellectual and political struggles are linked. In that sense, we stand with W.E.B. Du Bois, who stated in his book, Dust of Dawn, one could not be a calm, cool, and detached scientist while Negroes were lynched, murdered, and starved. We in Africana Studies are fortunate in having one of the founders of the department still with us, Dr. Lynette Bethel. And we ask that the rest of the faculty, including adjuncts, also stand. As we position ourselves to move forward for the next 40 years, we feel empowered by the visionary leadership of President McCormick. His commitment to diversity is already changing the campus environment. 
Two of his initiatives are filled with promise. One, the cluster hiring initiative, an effort to build a more diverse faculty. And two, the Rutgers Future Scholars Program, which prepares students from local communities to attend Rutgers University. We are delighted with these initiatives and we wish him well. It is my pleasure to introduce to you President Richard McCormick. Thank you, Professor Tate, and to everyone, good evening and welcome. I can't tell you how glorious this crowd looks. Literally, literally, standing room only. Welcome and, and thank you all. Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, takes enormous pride in welcoming Benjamin Todd Jealous, President and CEO of the NAACP, to our campus. His visit comes, as Gail has observed, as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Africana Studies Department and the 100th anniversary of the NAACP. Along with Department Chair Gail Tate, whom you have met, I want to thank Mr. Jealous and everyone present for helping us to mark these milestones with an extraordinary lecture and panel discussion this evening entitled Civil Rights in the Age of Obama. Forty years ago, <clears throat> Rutgers in the 1960s was an incomplete university. Rich in history and newly designated as the State University of New Jersey, it offered many outstanding fields of study and a talented faculty. But in failing to provide opportunity to all but a very small number of African Americans and in limiting its curriculum, Rutgers was falling far short of its potential. The year 1969 brought change. Through the brave protests of African American students on all of our campuses in Newark, New Brunswick, and Camden, and through the establishment of the Africana Studies Department here in New Brunswick. The protests also led to dramatic changes in admissions, in faculty recruitment, and in the curriculum. Establishing a department dedicated to African and African American culture was a critical step forward in broadening the curriculum to match an increasingly diverse American society. Ever since, the department has brought the social sciences and humanities to bear on a range of issues related to the African diaspora, language, musicology, literature, religion, and much more. Today, Rutgers is a university that embraces its diversity an institution that students, uh, to which students come from the widest range of backgrounds, cultures, races, and faiths. And Africana Studies is symbolic of the remarkable richness of the curriculum as it has evolved over the decades. To introduce our honored guest speaker tonight is someone who has also played a vital role in the evolution of the African American community. As a youth, he was involved in voter registration drives in southwest Georgia. As minister and president of the American Committee on Africa, he championed human rights around the globe, especially in Africa. As pastor of the Bethany Baptist Church in Newark since 2000, he established a nonprofit community organization that serves those in need, including those who have been incarcerated, and his career embraces so much, much more. I'm proud to call him my boss, because he is the chair of the Rutgers Board of Governors and fortunate to call him a friend. Please welcome the Reverend Dr. M. William Howard, Jr. It's a great day, huh? A great day. This is a, we're going to strike a blow against cynicism tonight. That's our enemy. Some of us are old enough to think we've seen it all. But when we have the privilege of, of seeing what the struggles of the past have wrought in the form of an excellent voice for the voiceless, we know there is reason for hope. In the Greek Bible, faith is defined as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen with our own eyes. 
If we can just hold on and dream and dare to struggle, what we hope for, in the words of Jim Forbes, will tangibilitate before our very eyes. And to the English professors, I don't think there's such a word. <laughs> but Mr. President and to the deans and our great faculty, leaders of the NACP, of which I'm proud to be a life member, all members of the Rutgers community, but especially the students, we are privileged tonight to be present together in this room. It is the best of times and the worst of times to borrow from Dickens. This morning, one of my trusted and valued friends and I were on the phone just marveling at the sweeping changes that have taken place in our lifetime. I will tell you that if you had told me when I was growing up in America's Georgia that this room would be filled with such an array of students such as this, I would have said, in the words of another famous gentleman, you lie. <laughs> but indeed, sweeping progress, Robeson would be very happy, especially about the Young Scholars Program. The Future Scholars, is that the right? Future Scholars Program. But our speaker will remind us, no doubt, that we have much unfinished business. In the central ward of Newark, young people for whom the Niagara movement had a great concern, a languishing, without a sense of purpose and hope. And I am so delighted that a person of a new generation well prepared for the task, has come to lead this great organization at such a time as this. You know, we know it as a domestic civil rights organization. Uh, we know it because of Thurgood Marshall and all the great warriors. One of my favorite NAACP giants is Miss Ella Baker. But what we may not know, and Ben Jealous does, the African National Congress took its lead in terms of nonviolent civil disobedience from the NACP that led to the Nobel Peace Prize going to its leader in the year 1961. I would say that in this day of Google, some of you are sitting now with your Blackberries, you can go and read about Ben Jealous and point out all the things I missed because you will see uh, so much there about him. So I won't concentrate on rudimentary bi uh, biographical details. What I will say, though, by way of interpretation, is if you read what you can about him, you will see that he is a man characterized by the courage to take risks. And uh, we are homogenized in ways that trouble me a great deal. I, I remember, Brother Jealous, in the 1980s, I came to Rutgers as a part of the American Committee on Africa, and I found some young people of different races lying on the floor on a hunger strike because they were opposed to apartheid in South Africa. I want to see more of that in today's student population. It is emerging here at Rutgers and around the nation. And who better than an icon of excellence, a man of achievement, a Rhodes Scholar, to come now and show us that taking risks is the only way we get there from here. He has a passion for justice. He has a passion for excellence. How many people would have been thrown out of Columbia only to go back and show them a few things by becoming a Rhodes Scholar? I met him today for the first time, and uh, I know people. That's my business. I know people. But I only met him today. But I know the Jackson Advocate. And I knew Charles Tisdale. And I know about Parchment Prison. I should declare in front of my president tonight, I have been in Parchment Prison. 
and to know of your work exposing the corruption in the prison in itself speaks volumes about your fitness for this task. And let me tell you, my prayer is that you won't let us, meaning we in the NACP, wear you down. <laughs> but President Harris, where are you? I'm going to say our task is to catch his vision and to travel light. Because we do have a tendency to travel heavy, especially when we go to the conventions, uh, taking everything we own in that suitcase so we can look good every day. Ben Jealous is a man who travels light because he has a vision for the new future. I also know how Columbia looks down onto Harlem from the heights. So I feel that while we've just met, that I have been given a new lease of confidence about our future. In other words, the elders of past ages had only one dream, not that they would see Barack Obama as president, but that we would raise up leaders prepared to fight for the unfinished business that still uh, lies ahead. The NAACP has a leader for the road ahead who, like his organization, has an irrational optimism about the prospects of America. And it is with this note that I present to you now with honor and with privilege, Mr. Ben Jealous, the leader of the NACP. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That um, most profound and thoughtful greeting I've ever received. So thank you. And thank you to President McCormick for having me. Thank you to President Harris, the New Jersey State Conference, for your leadership. And President Joyce Simmons of Newark, Charlene Robinson right here on Rutgers campus. Where are you, Charlene? Stand Oh, Charnay, I'm sorry, where are you, Charnay? You stand up? Back here? All right, I want just to know who she is. It costs 10 bucks to become a student member of the NAACP. See Charnay and her team doing important work. And, of course, Bruce, Bruce Morgan from New Brunswick. You know, we are a, an army of local volunteer community organizers and, and activists. My family's belonged to the NAACP for five generations. Uh, for that note, I want to thank my cousins for coming in from Montclair. It's good to see you. Um, for five generations, my grandmother's grandfather uh, was born a slave in Petersburg, Virginia, walked out of slavery right at the end of the Battle of Appomattox, went on to be a state senator, co-founded Virginia State University along the way, and when he, shortly before he, he, he died, he joined the NAACP, really as a charge to his children to continue the tradition of freed blacks during slavery, which was that every ounce of privilege you gained, uh, you invested half an ounce of privilege back in continuing the ladder of opportunity that allowed you to escape. And it's very much that spirit that guides the NAACP. It's 1,200 active branches around the country. It's 30 six state conferences and multi-state groupings and our uh, 600,000 activists in the field and online. So it's, it is a joy to be here with you tonight. You know, I'm going to talk a bit about this moment that we're in, you know, what it is to live in 2009. I'm going to talk about what we're each called to do in our lives. And I'm going to talk about courageous conversations, uh, what they look like and why we need to have more. A question for you. How many of you found your way down to Washington on January 20th? Raise your hand, please. All right. And how many of you watched on TV, watched the presidential inauguration on TV? All right. And the rest of you apparently don't own a TV. But, but the, um, the ones who watched it on TV are the smart ones. 
Oh, the small islands, remember how cold it was that day. It was, it was really cold.